Welcome to the Cox Family Visiting Scholar Public Lecture. The mandate for this lecture is to bring in a luminary to campus. And with Jonathan Z. Smith, we have done absolutely that. So uh, we want to welcome you to this wonderful event. First of all, I want to thank Jonathan Smith for being here and his wife Elaine for coming as well. It's a true honor to have you here. I know you're eager to hear Jonathan Smith, so I'll keep my preparatory remarks um, brief. My name is Greg Johnson. I'm the chair of the Department of Religious Studies here at C. Boulder. And I want to recognize that in the room tonight, we have people from University of Wyoming to the north, at least, possibly farther, you don't know. <laughs> and all the way down to Colorado Springs to Colorado College to the south. And a whole crew from Denver University and Iliff Seminary. So uh, this is a testament to the draw of Jonathan Z. Smith, how much he matters to this field. And we want to welcome you all, and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, a few words of appreciation are in order, first of all, for my, my colleague, Sam Gill, who he's done so much to help organize this. So thank you, Sam. Thank you. Also, I'd like to recognize uh, Shannon Trosper, Gina Samano, and Lisa Spiegel, three people in the department who've also done a great deal of work. I'd like to direct your attention to the program you have, and if you don't have one, shame on you. Uh, look on your neighbors. First of all, you'll see on the left-hand side a uh, mention of our website. We launched this last week. It was uh, a lot of work to do so. We're very proud of it. It says a lot about us, I think. And uh, lots of appreciation to professors Deborah Whitehead and Holly Bailey, who did so much to make that happen. Also in the program, I'd like to uh, turn your attention to the pictured faculty. They're pictured for a reason, because we're honoring them tonight. Three retired and retiring faculty, and I'd like them to stand up. Fred Denny. <laughs> and Rodney Taylor. faculty have served the department in so many ways, not uh, the least of which was multiple terms as chair in each of their cases, so their service has um, left a great mark. Thank you all so much. I also want to let you know uh, to look back to our website soon because we'll be having a reception in the fall, a proper reception to honor these three. You're all invited. Details for coming. At this time, I want to thank the Center for the Humanities and Arts for helping make this possible. They administer this lectureship, and in particular, I'd like to recognize Michael Zimmerman. Michael, are you here? Yes, Michael, can you please stand up. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank the Cox family, uh, for whom this annual visiting scholar program is named. They have provided generous funding for us to host this event. Needless to say, in hard times like these, it is a remarkable gift to be uh, asked to bring in a luminary and to be given the resources to do it in the right kind of way. So thank you so much for talking. <laughs> we are privileged tonight to have with us Jeffrey Cox, a professor of English and Humanities and also Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Uh, here on the CU campus, and he will come now and introduce my colleague Sam Jones. Thanks so much, appreciate it. Um, and so I've spent the uh, last number of years over in central administration. I don't have many opportunities to speak to a gathering of humanists such as this in the way I used to. As Greg said, I, I, or I guess he didn't say, but I was lucky enough to come to see, uh, see you helped start up the Center for Humanities and the Arts. Um, and we were all lucky that when I got sucked up into administration in Regent Hall, we were able to recruit Michael Zimmerman to take over the center. And I'd like to thank him for the great job he's done during his term in broadening and deepening the work at the center. Michael. When I came 
came here working with all of you and with people like Fred and Rodney and Lynn and with Graham Adi, our associate dean, in building the humanities and arts at CU. That was a truly great job. It was truly fun. So it's wonderful tonight to be away from administration where we are worrying about retirement incentives and a new provost to think about more spiritual matters and the practices which body forth our deepest beliefs. At times, it can seem as if universities are only concerned with calculating student credit hour generation, touting funded, funded research, and pursuing football glory. So it's good to be back at the heart and soul of the university, the humanities and arts, and their exploration of those things we value most, those things that make education liberal, that is both worthy of a free man or woman and liberating. It's a particular pleasure to be here tonight to help welcome this year's Cox Family Visiting Scholar. My parents and my aunt contributed some <coughs> funds to the Center for Humanities and Arts to help create something the faculty have long asked for. Opportunities to bring distinguished colleagues from around the world to be with us for some extended period of time. My parents, both lawyers, have made contributions here to help the humanities and arts at Western Washington, where my older brother teaches tram trombone to support music fellowships, and to the law schools at the University of Washington and Michigan to help access for women in the law. Deeply interested in religion, I know they would love to be here, but at 92, they don't leave Washington, D.C. much, and have asked me instead to send their best. It's now a great pleasure to introduce Sam Gill, who will in turn introduce our distinguished speaker. A student of Professor Smith's, Sam has had a long and distinguished career at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He is the main reason that CU is known for the study of indigenous religions in the Americas, with his work on Native American religious life moving out from the Navajo to think, as one of his publications puts it, beyond the primitive about indigenous religion in more complex ways. This important scholarship has in turn led him to ask questions about the ways in which we configure religious studies as a discipline. Not content with conventional academic work, Professor Gill, in the best experimental spirit of CU and Boulder, has branched out to do fascinating work in the intersections between religion and the body, play, and dance. His work takes on a new life in both the virtual world, where he, among other things, vlogs, something I can't imagine doing, <laughs> and in a more physical world, where he enacts his theories and insights, particularly as a practitioner and teacher of dance. Among his many accomplishments, one that I value personally, is that he taught my middle daughter a form of communal salsa dancing that continues to form an important part of her life beyond Boulder. <laughs> as in her case, Professor Gill has had a continuing and deep impact on his students, his colleagues, and his discipline. Please join me in welcome. Jeff, it's uh, awesome to uh, have you introduce me, and I want to express my gratitude to you and your family for making this kind of event possible. This is what a university really should be about, and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to do that here. Uh, Greg did a lot of thanking, but he needs also to be thanked, because um, he did a tremendous amount of work on this, so let's uh, give it <laughs> And I also want to take a moment to thank the students in my Smith seminar who uh, hosted Jonathan yesterday uh, in the conversation with Jonathan Smith that went on for two and a half hours. Uh, so they did a great job in that, so they should be recognized for that as well. And then, of course, since I've been around for at least 25 years sharing with these honored colleagues of mine who are we were actually at dinner tonight trying to figure out the best word for this, and it kept coming up as passing on, and I just knew that. <laughs> <laughs> They're elevated in some sense, but I was told strictly I should not say that tonight. <laughs> but they, uh, they have served the department, the university, and their fields in remarkable ways, tireless ways, for uh, decades. And um, I have watched them grow and develop uh, through that whole period of time, and I I extend my best wishes to all three of you that you will go on to great and wonderful things, which I know you are already in the process of doing that. 
I also want to simply thank uh, Jonathan and Elaine for coming to this uh, event. Uh, it's a great uh, honor for us here that they will that they have come uh, and will address us here tonight. Um, but it's uh, it's a personal honor for me as well because I actually arrived at the University of Chicago before Jonathan did. Uh, I was not on the faculty, of course. I was, <laughs> I was a poor student armed with a degree in math and a degree in business. Uh, and uh, I spent the first couple of years trying to figure out what I was doing there. And by the time I met Jonathan, I was in a state that I think in contemporary terms relating to mortgages, I was pretty much underwater. Uh, but I did meet him. The first meeting was terribly frightening, but uh, I, I did get over that. And in time, he actually reached out and, and, and helped me along. I would certainly not have survived if he had not shown some, uh, some sense that he felt that I had a place in the academic study of religion. Of course, it was 10 years before he wrote the, the article saying that there is no place on which a student of religion might stand. Uh, so I reflected on that later, wondering what the message really was there. <laughs> Actually, I think, it was a, I think it was an experiment anyway to take somebody into the University of Chicago Divinity School with a degree in math and business. I mean, this, is, this doesn't happen anymore. But I, I do owe certainly everything to Jonathan. He was a mentor of mine at Chicago. He certainly saved my height on many occasions. And since then, he's served as, uh, as an exemplar, uh, a, a model for everything that I would really want to do. Um, and of course, his stature is so great that one would never hope to even come in that same realm. But I do want to thank you personally, Jonathan, for all that you have done for me. I really appreciate that. Um, now the formal part. <laughs> Jonathan Smith's early preparation for the defining contribution he was to make to the study of religion began with a fascination for taxonomy and his study of grasses, complemented by a period of immersion in philosophy, succeeded by his Yale dissertation on James George Fraser's The Golden Bough. Jonathan often downplays the importance of his work on Fraser, and he never published his dissertation. Yet I believe that it is uh, important to, Im impossible to understand his work in depth without a careful consideration of this important study. His dissertation on Fraser was an amazingly broad, critical examination of hundreds of cultures framed by the deep concerns with how to study, frankly, how to comprehend the crazy shenanigans of human beings that we have come to call religion. Jonathan asked fundamental questions. How to compare? How to describe? How to evaluate a work in terms of its sources? I suspect that among the most important shapings, shaping influences were Jonathan's ongoing and intense discussions on religion and the study of religion with his colleagues Jacob Neusner, Hans Penner, and Robert Michelson. In 1963, the study of religion experienced a surprising boost by the United States Supreme Court. In the school prayer case, School District of Abington Township, Pennsylvania, versus Shemp, writing the opinion of the court explaining the inappropriateness of prayer in school, Justice Clark went on to write that nonetheless, Education is not complete without a study of comparative religion or the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. This passage opened and even mandated state-supported universities to the legal study of religion. Emphasizing the very language of Justice Clark's decision, that is, comparative religion and the history of religion, the Divinity School at the University of Chicago geared up to meet the anticipated demand for large numbers of faculty prepared to teach religion in state universities alongside such fields as geography and economics. Jonathan Smith began teaching at the University of Chicago in 1968. Jonathan brought an understanding of religion focused on difference, incongruity, and rebellion at a time when Chicago was electric with protest and rebellion. The country had already been shocked by the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, 
Months of violence seemed to culminate at the Democratic National Convention held in Chicago in August 1968. In January 1969, at the University of Chicago, students who had been engaged in ongoing protests through the fall of 1968 were angered by the failure of the faculty to renew the contract of a popular teacher. The protests soon led to over 400 students occupying the administration building, many remaining there for several weeks. 1969 was the year of Apollo 11 moon landing, the realization of the enormity of combat deaths of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam, Woodstock, the age of Aquarius, and the film's Easy Rider and Midnight Cowboy. <laughs> I also think I would turn as graduated from high school. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> you gotta kind of tell us your age. <laughs> Amidst the protests and strife and hope that characterized the late 60s in the U.S., so dramatically present in Chicago and at the University of Chicago, Jonathan Smith arrived in an environment powerfully uh, influenced uh, by his colleague and friend, Mircea Eliade. <laughs> Eliade's was a study of religion that was humane and inclusive, finding commonalities that would allow scholars to embrace as familiar the most disparate and dissimilar cultural and religious forms. By identifying patterns, Eliade's work had well served the need to somehow comprehend the almost unimaginable diversity of the history of religions. Yet, Smith showed that Eliade's understanding of religion had become overly predictable and, frankly, uninteresting. Smith's approach that would progressively replace that of Eliade took the now familiar language of situation, difference, incongruity, incredulity, taxonomy, comparison, redescription. Smith dared to ask questions that might at first seem naive, perhaps even offensive or insensitive, yet would invariably reshape what we do as students of religion. He dared to contend that students of religion have no place on which they might stand to ultimately defend what they say about others. He boldly proclaimed religion as the invention of scholars. Smith's messages and language and style resonated with the broad cultural milieu and with the changing mood of the university and the new demands to create an academic study of religion clearly different from its theological forebears. <coughs> Hammering away at various themes and ideas illustrated by careful, detailed applications to a great many cultures, over the decades, Smith uh, has spoken not to some culturally and methodologically delimited area within the study of religion, rather, Smith has spoken to the entire enterprise of the study of religion. As historically and culturally specific and detailed as Smith's work always is, it is never far from the broad theoretical issues that have literally provided the foundation for an academic study of religion. As a result, he has become arguably the most influential scholar of religion in the last 40 years. Despite the increasing narrow specialization that most scholars have pursued in the study of religion, resulting often in such atomization as to stifle general conversation, Smith has forced every area within this rambling field to reflect on and revise the way it understands itself as a study of religion. Were it not for his work, it would be difficult, I believe, to understand that there even is such a thing as the academic study of religion. Tonight, we anticipate a powerful and provocative message. As Jonathan Smith, after more than 40 years of defining and shaping the study of religion, addresses the future of the study of religion over the next 40 years. I expect this lecture will be a seminal statement that will long serve the emerging generation of scholars and students of religion. <coughs> Yet, as characteristic of his now classic 1978 Map is Not Territory, his message will likely not set forth a simple program, guide, or map to follow. Rather, I suspect what he says will be a provocation that will invite, perhaps uh, a better term would be, will force, partly through uh, irritation, 
extensive and ongoing reflection and interpretation. Smith often reveals his brand of humor, his fondness for play, his provocative message in the titles of his works. The title for tonight's lecture is certainly no exception. His title, Now You See It, Now You Won't, as he has explained it uh, in a letter to me, plays with the old stage magician's formula that I more, that I more associate with the patter of the three-card Monte operators of the pre-sanitized Times Square of my youth. This title has already provoked some of my colleagues, fearful in the presence of deans, of some possible implication about the uncertainty of the future of the study of religion associated with the word won't. <laughs> Yet, one lesson from the 60s is that there is great opportunity in times of crisis. Surely the very academy, not just the study of religion, now faces the challenge of recreating itself to not only meet, but to also take advantage of the current demands. We must hope that in 2050, the present time will be considered to have inspired the beginning of a new era in the study of religion. It is our responsibility, our charge, to bring all our wisdom and creativity to this task. Those who rise now to the challenge will be those who shape, perhaps even save, the future of the, ac the ac academic study of religion. So thank you for coming, and please welcome Jonathan Smith. While they're addressing some technical details, I neglected to mention that there is a reception immediately afterwards, one flight of stairs down, that you are all invited to. And there will be no Q&A in the interest of time. We'll just move downstairs. Uh, but Professor Smith will move with us. So if your questions are in there. Also, I see seats here. Please raise your hand if the seat's next to you. And those of you standing, um, find one if you wish before we get going. Please, have a seat. Has everyone found a place on which to sit? <laughs> <laughs> then I shall plunge. Sam obviously tipped me off, so I have scribbled a note which says, be sure to say, the first part of my title, when it's played on the stage magician's patter, refers, of course, to the turn of my academic generation to its successor. For this reason, the epigraph to this evening's presentation is from an interior dialogue, that is the guy's talking to himself, <laughs> by Maurice Blanchot, reflecting on a 1959 work of political philosophy by the German novelist and essayist Ernst Jünger. Will you allow as a certainty that we are at a turning point. If it is a certainty, it is not a turning. I have been asked to undertake this evening some guesses as to the possible contours of the study of religion over the next 40 years. I have added a spatial constraint to your temporal one. I shall largely focus on the North American enterprise. And so summarizing your assignment to me, I have substituted my preferred word, yes. This English term is derived from Germanic verbal forms signifying to try to get, to aim at, emphasizing both intentionality and the large possibility of failure. In contrast to the more confident assertions characteristic of practitioners of futurology, a thoroughly awkward term coined by Aldous Huxley in 1946, perhaps while on an LSD train. <laughs> <laughs> this evening, then, to revert to the 14th century English 
four, I will be more guessing about possible new directions in the study of religion, wagering within this secular setting on some possible terms in the near future of the academic study, largely within its arguable, quite distinctive North American setting. Now, in thinking through this exercise, I've been aided by linguistically oriented scholars who posit as the two elemental forms of temporality and human discourse, now time and other than now time, with the latter comprising two directional options, anteriority and posteriority. Posteriority being retrospective carries an aura of necessity, of having to be. Anteriority, the perspective future we are aiming at together this evening, carries the sense of wanting to be, signaling its participation in the neurotics of desire. Projected outwardly, our desired future is often reoriented and objectified as a future which comes to seek us out, uh, as in both the German and French terms for future, stressing that which approaches us from afar. Both of these characteristics give more latitude to the work of thought than do the more usual prosaic paraphrases of the duality past future as determinate, indeterminate, the no longer and the not yet. Now, as Sam, above all, will testify, oracular discourse is far from my usual mode of speech. I am comforted in this evening's endeavor by my assignments relatively for shortened temporal horizon. <laughs> I'm comforted by the fact that the exemplary prophets of the Hebrew Bible rarely extended their foretellings out for a span of more than two or three years. <laughs> if they were not, as in fact they did in a number of instances, predict events that had already occurred. <laughs> After all, in the usual way of things, a prediction is of little value. Its maker, an object of even less confidence, without relatively swift confirmation by its auditors. For example, despite our present, even if insufficiently urgent, preoccupations with global climate change over the long duration, we would have scant patience with a weather person beginning this morning's program with a forecast of the weather for the evening of April 13th, 2050. <laughs> a date by which no small number of us will surely have expired, while the living remnant will certainly have forgotten the prediction, leaving it utterly without validation. <laughs> that, by the way, will be the only foretelling this evening with which I have full confidence. <laughs> In the case with my Judean example, it is a fact that over time, under the influence of subsequent events, as well as the development of movements such as apocalypticism, and even later Jewish and Christian apologetic stratagem, the time span of the Judean prophecies were often retroactively extended, that within what came to be the known as the texts of the Hebrew Bible, there are numerous occasions of a prediction being updated by its transmitters, reapplied to new contemporary situations. The 8th century birth oracle of Isaiah, most familiarly and famously mistranslated in four respects within five words, as behold, 
a virgin shall conceive is a good example of these various shifts. It was initially a sign given with respect to the cessation of the syro ephraimite War and Judea's victory within the next two years, 735 to 732 BC. The original point of the prophecy, still plain even through its traditional and deliberate mistranslation, was not that a male child would be born, but rather that the war would be over by the time that child was weaned, usually understood to be a period of two or three years of age. Subsequently, the transmitters of this oracle updated the sign's relevance by a decade in order to shift its reference to the Assyrian conflict of 722. By the conclusion of a nearly 900-year trajectory of tradition history, the same Isaiah oracle was, as you all know, taken to refer to the birth of Jesus, embarrassingly somewhat dated at 6 B.C. There's uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like scholarly precision. <laughs> at the beginning of Matthew's late first or early second century gospel. Despite this reworking here, and in numerous other examples, the prophet's usual future remains that of a relatively short-term temporal horizon. In my own work over the last decades, I have devoted the bulk of my energies to the past, not just to ancient religious phenomena, but to disciplinary history. To what <coughs> quaintly called the history of the history of religions. <laughs> While this latter has a retrospective aspect to be sure, it has as well, as is the case with many such projects, a prospective one, even at times a reformist agenda. The hope that an understanding of the past will both inform and lead to the rectification of contemporary practice. While this blending of tenses is not uncommon in epigrammatic formulations that have become all but proverbial, ranging from Shakespeare's What is Past is Prologue to H.G. Wells, The Past is But the Beginning of a Beginning. It sounds like a Star Wars soundtrack. <laughs> it appropriately receives the more complex formulations by historians. Take, for example, this passage from an early 1820s essay by the young reformist philosopher Auguste Comte. The chronological order of historical epochs, he writes, is not their philosophic order. In place of saying the past, the present, the future, we should say the past, the future, the present. It is only when we have conceived of the future by the aid of the past that we can with advantage revert to the present so as to seize its true character. Comte's historiographical reflections lead me to those critical remarks by a consummate influential professional historian, that conservative British parliamentary old fogey Sir Louis Bernstein Namia, on a 1941 address, Symmetry and Repetition, in a passage that might equally have served as the epigraph to my presentation this evening. Napier writes, one would expect people to remember the past and imagine the future. But in fact, while discoursing or writing about history, they imagine the past in terms of their own present experience, and when trying to gauge the future, they cite supposed analogies from the past. Till by a double process of repetition, they imagine the past and remember the future. Now, in the mouth of a student of religion, 
even when I'm quoting another, the notion of repetition in history, let alone Namia's haunting specter of a double repetition, arouses suspicion of an entanglement in that specious, largely Christian apologetic distinction between myth and history, with the form of persistently characterized as cyclical and repetitive, the latter is linear as a succession of unique events. Such an unimaginative deployment of geometrical figures was at least perturbed by George Goosen's suggestion that rather than cyclicality, what he terms archaic views of mythic history exhibit, I love to say the word, an undulatory pattern <laughs> of resembling a sine wave rather than a circle. But even there, the duality persists. As I've argued elsewhere, such an allegedly cyclical view of history is found most often in divinatory context setting on which I find myself this evening, <laughs> and presumes the continued relevance and applicability of a quite limited repertoire of paradigmatic events to new situations. Please note carefully, this is an exercise in interpretative application. It has nothing whatsoever to do with repetition. That same general process appears in both learned and popular contemporary discourse. In the case of the latter, we can hear it every time we worry that our military adventure in Afghanistan will result in another Vietnam. We'll be charged that negotiating with Iran will lead to another Munich, or ask ourselves whether our <coughs> economic distress is really another Great Depression. Now the assignment you set for me this evening <laughs> specified that I guess about future directions in the study of religion over the next 40 years. I take it that the numerical interval 40 is equivalent to a generation as it is often understood in intellectual history. In demography of generation is defined as the average interval of time between the birth of parents and the birth of their offspring, and is governed by the rule three generations per century. A generation is conventionally then fixed at 33 years, often rounded down to 30. In contemporary popular speech, generation X, Y, and the like, a shorter span is in mind, perhaps no more than a decade. When I served as dean of the faculty of the college at the University of Chicago in the late 70s and early 80s, I would receive at the beginning of each school year a phone call from the education editor of a leading national news weekly asking me for my impression of the new incoming students generation. Tonight I shall remain with your proposed 40 years. Not alone because it has biblical resonance, the 40 year span of the wilderness wandering generation. What happens if you lack a map? But also a personal one. The temporal unit corresponds roughly to my tenure as a participating member of the academy. Having taught the study of religion, chiefly by choice to college students, for some 48 years. This may well have been in our convener's minds, along with the implication I take it, that I am to speak with you as one representative of the previous generation, forecasting possible concerns and preoccupations of some of you as you go forth to take your place in the next cohort, shaping the contours of our field. As I've already suggested, this will require, on my part, a play of tenses, modes, and modalities 
dramatically often signaled by auxiliaries such as should, would, could in the present rather than the past. This cannot be a disinterested undertaking on my part. My future is quite literally at stake and in your hands. As Wittgenstein shrewdly reminded us in one of those tantalizing notebook jobbings of his, this one from 1934, and I quote, when someone prophesies that the next generation will take up these problems and solve them, that is usually a sort of wishful thinking, a way of excusing himself for what he should have accomplished himself and hasn't. A father would like his son to succeed where he has not succeeded, so that the problem he has left unsolved shall find its solution after all. But his son will face new underlying problems. What I mean is, a wish for the task not to remain uncompleted wears the disguise of a prediction that the next generation will make progress with it. For the purposes of this evening's exercise, and within the geographic and temporal range already stipulated, my overall wager upon which all the others depend will be that, with one notable exception in all likelihood, the broad field will not experience so fundamental an alteration in the environment within which the study of religion will be practiced, as was enabled, though far from uniformly actualized, for the previous generation. And here is not infrequently Sam has foretold the, the story that I want to tell a little bit more uh, uh, elaborately. I must slightly cheat and hedge my wager for the instant gating event from which my generation must be dated occurred 47 years ago, June 17, 1963, although its effects were not felt until some indeterminate point well within my generation's temporal range. As you may have already surmised and Sam let out of the cat, I refer to the creative misreading of the 1963 United States Supreme Court decision in School District of Abington v. Shemp, forbidding compulsory Bible readings in a Pennsylvania district public school, a case that was combined by the court with a similar one from Maryland, Murray v. Curlett, protesting the same in which one of the petitioners on behalf of her son, William, was Madeline Murray, later O'Hare, who went on until her brutal murder in 1995 to become the most widely known American spokesperson for atheism. In a not atypical family drama, her son William, as an adult, became a successful evangelical Christian preacher, <laughs> authoring in 1995 a scathing attack on the Supreme Court's decision in his mother's case, let us pray a plea for prayer in our schools. Now I said misreading, uh, if you prefer a strategic reinterpretation, professional lying, which the Supreme Court justices are prepared to do every day, and rightly so. Because while many in the higher education community took the decision not only to permit, but to encourage the study of religion in public colleges and universities, that of course was not, and was far from, the issue of the case. It was not, after all, a case of study, but of a required religious exercise in the context of compulsory education of minors prior to their attaining the so-called age of consent. This latter group has traditionally been one. The court quite correctly has, has said requires particular protections 
against indoctrination and has given alleged cases of the same, especially when state-sponsored particular scrutiny, as in litigation involving compulsory recitals of the Pledge of Allegiance. Besides, the court has here a long history of deciding Bible reading cases in public schools to rely on. For the advocates of programs and the academic study of religion in public colleges and universities, the general and generalizable legitimating clause already cited was found in Mr. Justice Clark's majority decision, which went well beyond the facts in the case. It may well be said that one's education is not complete, I'm quoting, without a study of comparative religion or the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. The Bible, he continued, is worthy of study for its literary and historical qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such a study of the Bible or religion, when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education, may not be effective, consistent with the First Amendment. Even more advantageous to the advocates in higher education, many of whom were associated with the Society for Religion in Higher <coughs> Education and its prestigious Tent Fellowship program for graduate students dedicated to the same, and therefore even more frequently cited, although without legal authority, was Mr. Justice Goldberg's Obiter Dictum, although in most quotations, his unfortunate initial analogy, which I'll preserve, was excised. He opined, to use Mr. Bush's technical term. It seems clear to me from the opinions of past and present cases that the court would recognize the propriety of the state providing military chaplains and, not even a comma, military chaplains and of the teaching about religion as distinguished from the teaching of religion in public schools. Now leaving out the chaplains, Justice Goldberg's italicized prepositions became all but t-shirt slogans about yes, oh no. And I should go on to add that perhaps fortunately, except for some ancillary matters, the question of programs of study and departments in the study of religion in public post-secondary educational institutions has not, thank God, and I mean it, has not been litigated as such before the Supreme Court. The question of confronting, the question confronting the previous generation of students, even if they wished these quoted paragraphs to be framed in a more complicated language was how to fashion the study of religion, especially now in a whole new market for public colleges and universities, and how to train faculty for such an endeavor, then largely a graduate education conducted in private seminaries and universities, such a way to pick up the court's language as to be about religion, pre presented objectively as part of a secular program of instruction, including in the court's positive language, comparative religion or history of religion. This latter term in part accounts for the extraordinary influence of the ontotheological program of Mircea Eliade and the so-called Chicago School of the History of Religion. They had the brand name in the late 60s through the 80s in North America. Others turn to the equally ontological Protestant apologetic theological project of Paul Tillich and the notion of ultimate concern as meeting the court's apparent interest in tying religion to civilization and or culture. If now some of these impulses and influences have come to seem inadequate, 
even in fact badly misguided, they were surely potent then. In one authoritative survey, 25 programs, including denominationally funded schools of religion, were listed for public institutions of higher learning in 1960, three years before Abington. Remember the number, 25. By 1967, seven years later, four years after Abington, the second edition of the very same survey listed 135 such programs, a 540% increase better, I think, than some hedge funds. <laughs> the establishment of the American Academy of Religion, despite last year's claimed centennial, occurred in fact February 14, 1964, as a direct result of the momentum following the court's decision. We've come a long way in the field's interests and accomplishments from those days. As one who began his graduate studies in religion in 1960, pre-Abington, and completed coursework and received his first academic appointment almost immediately post-Abington, I was a distinct and grateful beneficiary of the seismic shift attributed to that decision, even though they may not be found necessarily within. In 1960, and I don't usually use first-person address, but in 1960 when I began at Yale, the prerequisite for doctoral studies in religion was a post-baccalaureate Bachelor of Divinity degree, a degree aimed solely at training Protestant clergy. With a series of adjustments to standing requirements occasioned by my being only the Divinity School's second non-Christian student, I began a course of ministerial studies that omitted only the practical parts of the program. But the Dean of Students jocularly and over-familiarly with his arm around me explained was the how to sprinkle courses. <laughs> By 1960, but not regretting it because I didn't have a raincoat in those days. By 1964, immediately following Abington, I was able to transfer to the brand new graduate department of religion located within the arts and sciences, no longer in the Divinity School and begin working as Yale's first doctoral candidate in the field of history of religions. The enormous advantage in that they had no faculty in the field of history. I was charged with teaching myself. <laughs> now, outside of that delicious consequence, let me repeat the point of this anecdote. Prior to 1963, with very few exceptions, unless one was a graduate student in philology, philosophy, or some other field who happened to have an interest in religion and got the field to go along with it, the only route to professional certification as a college teacher of the study of religion began with a degree designed to lead to the ordination of a Christian minister. There was no way around it. Now I've dealt elsewhere with both the intellectual and the curricular implications of this history, and will not rehearse it here. It becomes, however, the background for my forecasts as I shift from the past prologue to my present assignment as to its future. I've listed out from a longer initial list five items that I'm willing to guess might be constitutive areas of interest for students of religion over the next 40 years. They each extrapolate from tendencies already present, but largely in nascent, undeveloped forms. For this reason, their future elaboration, while not necessary 
will be, I think, scarcely accidental. The accidental in its ordinary sense is always possible, especially with respect to oh, the federal government getting a hold of me. <laughs> I haven't got to the juicy stuff yet. <laughs> I'm just giving standard old crap so far. Now we're, now, we're, now we're getting to the religious future. <laughs> All right, I guess I told you this is a shorter list than the list I began with, that they extrapolate from things already here. Uh, the accidental, however, is always possible, especially with respect to unanticipated discoveries of new significance data. The dominant role of the chance findings of new texts from Quran and Nag Hammadi was played in biblical studies over the past 40 years, is the sort of thing I have in mind. At the present time, the opening of the hitherto highly restricted state archives of the former Soviet Union promises a similar flood of new and important data ethnographies, texts, transcriptions, recordings, films, which when cataloged and distributed will, I am certain, revolutionize both the fields of shamanism as well as world, as well as Central Asian religions and the role of world religions in those regions, most particularly Islam, and will do so strikingly for the next generation of scholars. Four of these items have, at least in my funny mind, some coherence of relationships. The fifth, which for this reason I shall present as my first, is of a different character. But it may turn out to be the precondition for the bulk of subsequent developments, both those anticipated and hopefully those not. It appears already to augur a change of sufficient magnitude to make all other present predictions even more uncertain. It is the exception already referred to to my self-limitation to the North American scene. It will likely as well reintroduce, introduce and recall excruciating epistemological and interpretative problems as its effects become more, more widely felt. So, item number one. I refer here to an alteration in the environment of the study of religion that is now in process, the effects of which will prove for the new generation far greater and far less parochial than the shift in my generation that took Abington v. Shem as its emblem. It is the present, increasingly rapid, and far-reaching internationalization of the body of scholars comprising our field. Institutionally, the International Association for the History of Religions has already, although not without considerable controversy since the late 1950s, uh, prompted and promoted a range of national and regional associations for religious studies beyond its accustomed Euro-American boundaries. More recently, the American Academy of Religion is mumbling something about doing the same, prompted in part by the late Indian Smart, although it is Europe at this point that appears chiefly in view. But these cumbersome international political structures, as with so many analogs, have been overtaken by electronic technology, a subject about which I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> Already, I've told that digital modes of communication, chiefly in English or with English abstracts, enable cooperation and shared knowledge between these widely distant associations. Digital modes of publishing, storing, and retrieving, I am told, have mitigated to no small degree the economic barriers to such intellectual globalism in the study of religion, as I am told they have for every other academic discipline. 
I would take tonight as an early and promising landmark of this now inexorable movement the 2007 publication of a handbook edited by Greg Alice and published by Rutledge, Religious Studies, A Global View, which provides by native authors, regional histories, and institutional developments in Western and Eastern Europe, North and Latin America, West, East, and Continental Asia, Japan, North, South, and Sub-Saharan Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, and this last category, the Pacific Islands. Of particular, and also of relativizing relevance to my address this evening, the handbook's format includes the detailing of emerging, is of emerging issues considered urgent from the perspectives of each of the above the name 11 regions. Not as yet wrestled with, now the downside, or the, although the promising side for thought, with except in sporadic confrontations, is the question of responsibly reframing without retreating from questions concerning first-person authority as well as parallel issues with respect to claims of the privilege of the interpreter. These heretofore have largely been held by Euro-American scholars as monologues, in which the same voice takes up both sides of the question. With an increasingly global professionalization of the study of religion, this ventriloquism is no longer plausible, it's no longer an option. But the issues are not thereby dissolved. It remains the case that a perception of difference and or distance, whether of a spatial or a temporal sort, whether intercultural or intracultural, works as a necessary assault on the presumptions of common sense most especially the presumption of self-evidence and the presumption of my universality, quite characteristic of scholars and students of all the human sciences, nowhere more so than in the study of religion. The recognition of difference and distance yields perspective. No, please not, I want to insist, any kind of objectivity. Distance and difference, especially between cultures, often leads to enterprises for Paris. To the degree that these occasions surprise, they often result in efforts of explanation and translation. Distance and difference within a culture often leads to the formation of a historical consciousness among the consequences of this latter are the ability to perceive the implications of a past occurrence over a period of time, a recognition thereby of its unintended as well as its intended results with its latent as well of its, as its manifest intentions. This sort of awareness of what I've already called a reception history is what Kant had in mind when in 1781 he wrote with a magisterial sense of counterintuitiveness, we understand Plato better than he understood himself. <laughs> a claim that, el that eliminating that awkward comparative better and usefully correcting and reformulating Kant's sentence was re-advanced by Heidegger in the course of his interpretation of Kant. Quote, one never understands, he writes, an interpret a text better than its author, but rather understands it differently. To which I would add that that's the sort of difference that makes all the difference. Now, how does how this understanding otherwise 
this necessary difference in understanding works to achieve cognitive gain, not just embarrassment, is an ongoing project within the human sciences, again, nowhere more so than in the study of religion. Because the, the interpreter is different, is distant in some specified respects. She may perceive elements that others may not perceive about themselves and this <coughs> person. Most particularly and problematically, that people do not always act as they say they think or believe that they do. This incongruity, this gap, this utterly commonplace doubleness, or at times, duplicity, provides necessary space for understanding. Within the anthropology of religion, I still think Victor Turner's discussion of the Indembu milk tree rituals remains the classic description of just that sort of gap. The globalization of the human sciences and the study of religion raises anew the question of how to train scholars for that sort of surprise, that achievement of understanding differently in the face of a renewed jargon of authenticity at times associated with the very same process of globalization. Both the insider and the outsider are utterly relative and constantly shifting positions with respect to some particular this or that. Both represent, both re-represent, both translate their traditions, both to their peers, however understood, and to others, however they be defined. It is this ongoing activity, all this reading, that allows a tradition to be, in fact, traditional, and thereby to endure. The study of religion, in part, entails the study of culturally re repeated representations embedded in those cultural formations and practices that we think comprise our subject matter. In some circumstances, the rhetoric of representation will be in a reproductive mode, in others, in a transformative mode. These are strategies, not states of being not permanently in or permanently out. Likewise, the choice of the rhetoric, I'm near or I'm far, of emphasizing consensus or tensions, of foregrounding or backgrounding one's constructive or deconstructive labors. I would argue that the rhetoric of pristine, of authentic, should give us hope or it conceals, it sets aside the work, the intellectual labor that has been done by both parties in this exchange. Here, the evaluative questions will remain chiefly those of varying degrees of adequacy and of the variety of modes of competence, all in the book. Item number two. With these issues of tradition, of the conflicts of reinterpretations in mind, I venture a second guess. Partly out of an imagined fidelity to Abington, who was common in the 60s to define the study of religion in general, and alas, the study of the history of religions in particular, as anything but theology, a matter therefore of the about rather than of the of. If this is taken to imply that the aim of the study of religion is not in many respects coextensive with its systematic self-interpretation responsible not only to intellectual integrity but also to some particular construction of the tradition, I might agree somewhat grudgingly to some degree subject only to my previous strictures that all such positions are relative 
But I would insist as well that internal systematization of beliefs and activities is an important, all but ubiquitous element in that characteristic imperialism of any known religious form, as it strives to leave often nothing beyond its interpretative sphere. For this reason, native theologians, whether near or far, become an important part of the data for any study of religion, though not necessarily of its validation or its control. There are two sorts of signs that this period of chaste abstention may be coming to an end. That studies in a comparative systematics or comparative exegetical strategies are now possible. I've suggested elsewhere that the closest parallels to this sort of systematization, whether in written or in oral form, are to be found in three contexts, legal, divinatory, and educative. All three of these subjects are receiving renewed attention both within and without the study of religion. I anticipate and welcome their further growth, most especially with respect to law, always an interest of some, and education, a surprisingly neglected field in the study of religion, considering its historical and cross-cultural relations to religion. How does religion get transmitted through some structure of education? The broader field of the systematic per se, even in its narrowest taxonomic biological sense, has been taken up and re-signified by the growing field of cognitive studies of religion, to which I'll return by way of conclusion. Let me there offer one footnote to Sam's remarks out of an overabundance of caution. When I was a student of the, and given your forthcoming celebration, uh, when I was a student of the taxonomy of grass, it was the thing that cows ate, not humans spoke. We'll leave you all of that to Sam's uh, introduction. <laughs> One of the prime achievements of the post abington generation of scholars was a focus on the generic noun religion, which needs to be set off, despite the stupid prejudice of copy editors with single quotes, in order to signify that religion is a word to be understood only in relation to other words. There ain't no things when you have that around them. This is a settled revolution. Indeed, it is now possible in some graduate degree programs to do what was surely impossible and inconceivable in my graduate student days, to work on a critical study of generic religion without the prerequisite of studying any particular religion. Now, I'm just old enough to be nervous about this development, <laughs> but at the same time, cautiously welcoming it. As a word, however, one of religion's prime contexts remains a legal one, <coughs> it always has been, and therefore, to some degree, a political one. The agenda announced in 1994 by the late Gary Lease at UC Santa Cruz, whose premature death was a grievous loss to our field, will be one characteristic, I think, of the future study of religion. He writes, there can be no such enterprise as the history of religion for the simple reason that there is no religion. Well, let that part go. Such a history can only, now the important part, because we are talking about word, such a history can only trace how and why a culture or epoch allows certain experiences to count as religion. 
such tracings as Lee suggests, I want to I want to insist, suggest how a scholar is worked and how a curriculum in religious studies might well be organized. Items that are selected to count as religion with no particular necessity except within a particular realm of cultural constraint to make that particular selection. Now items three and four need to be taken together, so item three of these are quicker than the last uh, two. I don't reflect quite as much <laughs> as time. Over the past uh, 20 years, spurred in no small measure by feminist scholarship throughout the human sciences, there has been increased attention, as you all know, first to gender, and then more generally to body. The first was rapidly taken up with respect to religion, and we have seen the beginnings, which I expect to grow and become central, of attention to religion as an embodied <coughs> phenomenon. This reorientation has been parallel during the same period, here under chiefly the influence of varied European neo-Marxist approaches by attention to religion as a material phenomenon. And I'm actually quite the same. With greater but not exclusive attention, both have been joined under the rubric visual religion, which strikes me as a little too safe. <laughs> All of these approaches converge in connecting a centuries-old tendency to focus on ex religious ideas, expressed largely through the media of words and texts, not at all surprising as the origins of the study of religion in Europe lay largely in philology. So Zur, however, a long time ago reminded us that language has both a physical dimension, sound, so that it was adjusted a few minutes ago, and a mental one, sense, and they may not be dissevered. It'll be the work of the next generation to then relax the dualism, to bring together word and thing, body and sense, word and act, if the process has already begun, resignifying hitherto pejorative terms such as idol and fetish, which are sort of the nadir of such an approach. After all, a religious phenomenon such as a relic depends on its physical nature. It's got to endure almost by definition. And it, it is its chemistry that allows it to have been present in accessible form, both then and now. It has as well what some would call an indexical character, a real material connection to that which it now signifies. Research in such areas, and there's much going on now, will surely increase built on what has already been accomplished. Item four, by way of a brief notice of a field that has gained increasing study since the 1970s at precisely one of the junctures I've just alluded to, I would privilege the future enlargement of work on gesture as a mode of nonverbal communication. It's a polite academic term paralinguistic is too limited. It makes it parasitic almost upon uh, language. Uh, it can be a language proper. It can be an accompaniment to speech. It can extend, reinforce, or comment on it. If I wink now, you know I don't really mean what I've just <laughs> said. As well as standing alone as signal or a sign. It is essential to the performative dimensions of religion. And while it is still relatively under-theorized, its development promises much. 
Item 5, last, that would equal brevity. I need only this evening to call your attention to a relatively new but already central area of study. Perhaps the first to make plausible a claim to be a science of religion in that causal questions play the dominant role. It provides us with a new range of conversation partners. And to judge, quite frankly, from research grants alone, it is already and surely will become one of our more dominant fields in the next 40 years. While variously characterized and named, at present its most frequent title is Cognitive Studies of Religion. At its present stage, it exhibits all the characteristic virtuosic attributes of a relatively new enterprise. A variety of founding works representing widely different interests and, for that matter, vocabularies, approaches, data. There is already a second generation who work quite comfortably amidst these divergences and begin to experiment with their syntheses. Thomas Lawson provides one form of the crucial translation sentence, and I quote, whatever it takes to explain how minds work generally will be sufficient to explain how religious minds that's the crucial translation from experimental neuropsychology and neurophysiology to my favorite studies of both biological classification systems, the whatever it takes turns out to be extraordinarily wide indeed. But I should add that practitioners of both the just mentioned extremes have produced in the last decade substantial works on religion that are of importance and will decisively mark some of the more important new directions within our study over the next four years. By way of conclusion, allow me one extremely brief codicil. None of the elements I have lifted up <coughs> may in fact prove to be the dominant characteristic preoccupations of the coming academic generation. After all, its contours are truly not for me to imagine that time of my fellows and I has largely run. Now you see us, now you won't. But rather for some of you yet to inscribe. Still there is one thing I know with perfect surety. A line some of you will know occurs from the Book of Common Prayer's funeral liturgy. This I know with perfect surety. However the field of the study of religion develops, however the work of religions alters their courses, the subject will remain sheerly fascinating. As with our everyday commonplace and common sense reality, we habituate ourselves to that fabric of rules and roles we learn and master. It seems permanent, but in fact is never really finally fixed. A framework that needs on our part never to be a conscious object of our attention, unless perturbed by some unexpected shock, some other's gaze, or by some scientist's intervention. The kaleidoscopic capacity of religion, whether by design or by instinct, to rearrange, reorganize, reinterpret, resignify, recolor, reinvent that economical set of basic elements, their repertoire, if you please, so as to produce changing patterns and novel permutations, while at the very same time characteristically strongly denying that anything in fact has changed at all will surely persist, as will the students delight and damned hard work in disassembling, understanding, and translating their damned hard work 
in producing their system of beliefs and of actions. In this delight and through this labor, as it has been for each academic generation, past's prologue will find its future and its albeit temporary satisfaction. Thank you. Please uh, go downstairs to the reception and we'll carry on there.